I had the amazing opportunity to speak with some of the heads of UK disc golf, and they clearly care so much about the sport that it is truly inspiring. And I think you'll get a lot of joy out of this interview. I actually have two different interviews, one with the British Disc Golf Association with Harry Messenger and a second interview with the northern part of the UK, representing more of like Glasgow and Edinburgh and more of the Quake Tour, which overall, it was just so fascinating to hear all about these people that are truly making a change and what the future of disc golf will look like in these regions. And as you can tell in their interviews, it is much, much harder to make change because the land is just so locked and expensive. So they really have some unique challenges that they have to face. And it is truly inspiring to hear what they have to say. And honestly, this feels like one of those moments where I'm in a call and I'm just like, how did I get here? I feel so grateful to get time with these people that clearly care so much about disc golf and are willing to put in the effort. So be sure to check out some links in the description that will go into more detail about all of this. But with that, let's get into it. So if you were watching my previous video about the uh, British disc golf tour and how it will probably become a mainstay in the disc golf world. I actually have the tournament director of a lot of those events, Harry Messenger. What's up? Hi, <laughs> good to be here with you. Thanks, Matt. And as far as your background, how did you get to be in this position and what led up to it? Yeah, I was really lucky. Um, I stumbled across disc golf in kind of an unusual way. Uh, I used to live in a place called Leamington Spa, where one of the best known courses in the UK called Quarry Park is. Um, and one day I was looking for something to do with some friends, just stumbled across Quarry Park and I uh, been hooked ever since that was 2017. And um, six years later, seven years later, I'm still uh, just as obsessed as I was back then. Um, I got into kind of this kind of this, uh, my official role is the uh, competitions director at the BDGA, which is the British Disc Golf Association. And um, I got to this position by um, kind of taking my love to the sport to the next level and starting to run some tournaments. Um, I volunteered to run the British Championships in 2021 because there was nobody else volunteering to do it. Um, so I ran it alongside a more experienced TD and uh, we won TD of the year for the tournament. So uh, people liked it. And from there, I've just been running events ever since. And um, in 2022, there was a void in the um, kind of organizational level of the BDGA. Um, the tour was kind of a little bit, felt a little bit haphazard from the outside. It was very hard for people to get any insight into what was going on. So uh, especially the amateur side of the tour, um, there was not a lot of focus being put into it. So I decided to volunteer my time and uh, run the amateur tour. And last year we ran a very successful amateur tour. And based on the back of that, I was asked to step up and run the entire of the tour for this year. Wow. And just to put into context, what level of effort goes into like each event? Oh, it's, uh, it's a big deal. Um, so my role as di tour, tour director um, means I have to kind of try and get all of the TDs to agree to their schedules uh, as far in advance as possible. Uh, you'll have seen we published the schedule for 2024 on the 31st of um, December, which was me fulfilling my pledge to get it out in 2023, mm -hmm. uh, which is the first time we've ever had that. Um, we've got some friends, friends, um, there's a Scottish Disc Golf Association as well, and they're very organized in Scotland and they get all their tour dates out months and months and months in advance. So uh, we're trying to play catch up with them and um, evolve our tour structure and try and uh, try and match what they're doing up there, as well as uh, bring our own spin on a lot of stuff. So, so yeah, from my perspective, it's kind of getting all the TDs in line, trying to get registration dates synchronized to be three months before the event. So people, we had a big issue last year at the tour where everyone's registrations opened really close to each other mm. and people were having to sign up if they wanted to play all the events. They were having to sign up for like five, six, seven tournaments all in the same month, which is quite expensive for people. Oh, yeah. um, so it's better if they're spread out throughout the tour. So we're trying to do things like synchronize the dates where they all, um, where the signups come out to be three months before the tournament because then they're fairly nicely staggered throughout the tour. Um, and then obviously I'm also TDing three of the events, including one of the, what we call majors, uh, which is the first ever iteration of the British National Championships, which we're running in the summer. So a lot of my time goes into organizing those events as well as everything else. Assuming the answer is no, but do you get paid for this current position or is it all just volunteer no. work? No. Yeah. Yeah, it's, vol it's volunteer work. Uh, I run the tournaments through a limited company for kind of tax reasons um, mm. so that I doesn't get all mixed up with my personal finances, but uh, the company is not really there to make money. Yeah. Um, and if it ever does, that money will get back in invested back into the events. I do it for the for the love of the game, not for yeah. not for personal profit. <laughs> uh, I wanted to clarify that that's at this point, and then obviously there is potential if the sport grows where it could eventually become something which can be um, 
moneymaker, I would be definitely wouldn't be opposed to that because it would let me put more of my actual time in rather than just hours on evenings and weekends. Yeah. And yeah, how do you find kind of a way to balance your full time job with what seems to be a decent amount of work for no money? Uh, my wife is the same. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think a lot of the time that is required to organize the tour and the events is front loaded into the winter, um, which is quite nice because obviously I'm not out playing as much. Uh, I do play a lot of the events as well. I'm still very much into that. Um, but obviously I don't have to be out practicing so I can put the time I would be out in the evenings after work or whatever um, into that. I am currently spon sponsored as an ambassador by Cast the last as well. So I do actually need to put some time into uh, practicing, That'd but nice. um, most of my time goes into uh, running the tour at the moment. I think on average at the moment, I'm spending about 15 hours a week okay. organizing the tour and the events. So it is manageable, but it's uh, a decent shift of work on top of the full-time job and so pretty much every event that you're running you really can't participate you have to do administrative work yeah um all of the b tiers i wouldn't obviously wouldn't be allowed to play as td um the first event of the season i'm running is a c tier the event was added as a kind of emergency backup for an event that didn't come together in time to make the tour Hmm. Um, so that one I am planning on playing, but uh, I'm very lucky that my assistant TD in that event will um, happily man the desk and run the event on the day so that I can participate. So what would you say is like the biggest challenge that you face dealing with like this whole new category of like tour and obviously you have like the Euro tour, so you have to like potentially do stuff with that. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge was probably making sure all the dates lined up. Hmm. Um, obviously I'm trying to coordinate 15 events across the country but there's also like you said the Eurotour one of our TDs especially is uh, Noah Smithson who you mentioned in your previous video and he um, actively participates and plays the entire Eurotour so oh, wow. for him having his event specifically not conflict with the dates of the Eurotour is very important um, mm -hmm. he's trying to he's, he's maybe making the biggest push of any of the TDs to, towards trying to professionalise the standard of his tournament um, and he wants to be able to get some of the players he knows from the Euro Tour over here to play in it and really bring kind of our events up to the next level. And I think managing date conflicts for all of that was one of the trickiest parts of uh, establishing the tour. How do you kind of perceive where the, the tour is at and like <clears throat> kind of how there's, there's not a ton of professional players that are coming to the UK to play events? Like primarily if they're from Europe, they stay in Finland, they stay in Sweden they're not actually coming to your events like how do you intend to like change that and how do you feel about it yeah i would say the uk has a very long history of professional disc golf um it's not as well known as the other countries but it's been around for much longer um mm. we've had we have we're lucky to have a hall of famer derek robbins in the uk who's been playing since the 70s we've lucky to have charlie mead who's the wfdf coordinator um, so we've got people who've been around forever and yeah. even the European Championships has been hosted in the UK before. So it's not like we've never had any professional players come to the UK. Um, however, in the last few years, we've had, uh, we've had less and less, um, as the tours have got more professionalized in Europe and we've fallen behind in terms of payouts, um, back in the day when there was no payouts anywhere, it didn't really matter, but now, yeah. uh, you can make a, make a decent amount of junk of change playing in Europe. So, um, we're behind on that, but we're looking to bring in sponsors. We're looking to invest in um, improving the tour. We're looking to get dates out earlier so that people can plan their summer holidays around it because the UK is still a destination that a lot of people want to travel to and uh, experience and people will want to play tournaments while they're over here. Getting the dates out the previous year lets people kind of think, oh, there's going to be an event in July. We can plan two weeks in Europe and one week in England and then come to this event. Yeah. yeah and I will straight up say, state that I am not by any means a political expert about the UK, but do you perceive any um, like perceived political conflict with other European nations and how they kind of view the UK? And maybe that's attributing to part of the reason why there's a lack of participation? Yeah, I think that the UK is still pretty well respected in general in Europe, but we did make it a lot harder for people to travel here when we left the European Union. Um, I think that's sometimes less relevant to the um, Baltic and the Nordic countries who don't generally tend to be part of the Schengen zone anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it but it does make that more tricky. And uh, I think there is some anti 
um, anti-UK perceptions around, but I've never really experienced that in disc golf. So yeah. I, I hope that doesn't make too much of a big difference. Yeah. Um, but the, pra the practicalities of having to travel across the ocean rather than just jump in your car is, uh, is certainly something that, that makes that harder for them to commit to. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually going to Finland next month and just seeing how cheap it is to fly from one country to the next. I'm like, why can't the U.S. be this way? It's, it, it, it does <laughs> yeah, seem, it is pretty good. Yeah. I assume you are pretty aware of the, the Quake Tour and I think it's Ireland, Scotland. Yes. And yeah, what, what uh, about them do you want to kind of emulate? What about them do you see as like, are you doing anything better? Uh, so historically, um, there was only one tour. Back in, even when I started playing, so six, seven years ago, the Quake Tour wasn't really so much of a, of a thing. Um, there's been a lot of po politics in UK versus England versus Scotland in the disc golf scene, which I am not going to get into right now, partially because I don't understand it, but yep. um, all of that is much beyond my, my level. But um, we're working really hard to re-combine re, uh, some more things with Scotland and work closer with them, um, identifying that they want to run their side of the sport differently to us is really important and um, not actively fighting that and just trying to find ways to work together is definitely progress. Um, there's some really good collaboration going on. For example, uh, we're in negotiations right now for the Scottish tour to have a couple of events which award our points as well, in addition to their points, and so that potentially some Scottish players can um, end up coming to our finale. Mm -hmm. And last year, uh, the SDGA sent down some players. They paid for their, some of their players to come and play at our and finale, which was uh, really nice. Um, so there is some good collaboration going on. Uh, their tour is really fantastic. Their um, communication and stuff is a real inspiration to me, trying to get the tournaments out early and announced, um, trying to make sure that the registration is fairly centralized. Uh, we're working on a new website for the BDJ at the moment, so we're going to be kind of trying to have a central repository for all of the signups, where, where links to go to. I think that's something that the Scottish tour has been ahead of us for, especially the last few years. And also the sponsorship model. Um, they had a overall sponsor for the tour much a long time before we did. And um, one more thing that they did that I blatantly ripped off was uh, they had disc golf pins trophies. Hmm. So they got some disc golf pins for first, second and third and got them branded up and stuff and had them added as extras for all of the TDs at the tournaments. And ever since I first went up to the Scotland and played a Quake Store event a few years ago and uh, saw the pins, I was just like, we have to do that. <laughs> so we did that We did that last year and we're hoping to do that again this year. So it's uh, really, really good. Nice. You are like a pretty decent player, right? Yeah, I'm 930 rated. Okay, nice. Uh, do you ever see yourself going to a Euro Tour event and like, do you want to, is that an aspiration for you? Or are you kind of like, I'm pretty happy with my current role. I don't really care about going to the next level. Yeah, I absolutely love traveling. Um, and I've been already to play two different events in Europe. Um, two years ago, I played the Estonian Open. Oh, nice. um, and then last year I played in Norway at uh, Lille Lilland um, called the RPM Open. Hmm. And um, those are both massive inspirations for me as a tournament director, seeing the professionalism of those events seeing how good the courses look with all the branding and the banners and the signage and the marquees, uh, the press, um, seeing how much money and time and effort all of the TDs are putting into their events for these eight years was massively inspiring to me as a TD. And I'm actively trying to improve my own events based on things that I've um, found, found there. Um, going over to Norway last year for the RPM Open was spectacular. It's such a great course. Um, and seeing the amount of passion that SDM, the owner of the property, has for disc golf and seeing the amount of uh, passion that the Swedish Disc Golf Pro Tour brought to the event, um, playing their rounds in the morning and then running around with cameras after filming, um, just so much going on, um, absolutely mm. incredible. And if anybody, if I could recommend one thing to anybody, it would be to travel and play disc golf because it's just <laughs> a way of combining two passions. It's just fantastic. Oh yeah, I'm right there with you. Maybe a pipe dream, but I thought I'd ask. So seeing how Paul is making an appearance at a lot of European events, I want to say like four or five next year. Uh, do you think there is a possibility where he might come to one of your events? Um, I know like the, the scale is a little bit different, but do you ever see that as like a possibility or goal in your mind? Um, not necessarily Paul Macbeth specifically, but um, certainly touring pros. Um, yeah. We're lucky enough in the UK to be very attractive to American um, travelers. Uh, Americans love coming to England and Americans like going places they can speak the language. 
and um, it's been really nice. The last few years, we've had quite a lot of US touring pros actually stop off in the UK on their way around the world, mm-hmm. uh, which has been which has been really cool. Um, I know for a fact that Greg Barsby was here last summer and did some clinics. Um, Scott Stokely spent what seemed like half a year in in the UK last year, and um, Jen Allen's been over. We're quite lucky that um, a lot of pros think of the UK as a destination to come stop over yeah. and because they want to experience the culture the culture here and so hopefully yeah we'll see some people play some events I know Scott Stokely played quite a few last year and um, dominated but uh, <laughs> it would definitely bring up our our skill level I yeah. think Paul coming is unlikely because we can't offer the amount of added cash that would make it worthwhile for him to add us to his schedule. Yeah. Um, but I know, I know Ricky Wysocki came to Wimbledon to watch the tennis last year, so maybe if an <laughs> event lined up, somebody would, uh, would show up. Yeah. If you could be brutally honest with yourself, how do you think the courses in the UK are and how do you think they compare to other courses around the world? Um, we've got some good courses, right? But they're good amateur level courses. Yep. We don't have courses that are difficult enough to challenge the best players in the world, and that makes developing really good British players hard. Hmm. Um, we're progressing in that front. Um, a really nice thing that happened was Quarry Park, which is already one of our best courses, bought some extra land and expanded and made a par five and a few extra holes in Morrow B. Um, that will take 20 years for all the trees to grow in and be a really amazing part of the, of the course, but Quarry Park is a place where you could run a Euro Tour event. It's not it wouldn't be that hard for a lot of the players but it's technical um you have to be able to throw like 330 to 350 feet absolutely dead straight a lot of the time so uh, it is a skill that pro players come over and struggle with um yeah. and in fact it's been on various european tours um throughout the throughout history i guess until the last few years hmm. uh, also there's a course in scotland called uh, blue bell woods which is seamus's course um that used that has had a hosted a Euro Tour a few times. It had a Euro t- Masters Tour, I think, either last year or the year before. So there's a couple of courses which we have which are of good enough quality that we can understand where the rest of the courses need to go. But it's a really tough challenge in the UK getting access to enough land to build a really good disc golf course. Yeah. Um, we're not lucky like in the US where you've got so much open space where every city, every town has several parks where you can put a full course in. Yeah. Um, our, our land is at a massive premium and also people here don't know what this golf is. Like if you walked <laughs> up to a random person on the street and asked them, they've got no idea. There's no yeah. way. Unless they're in maybe the specific bit of Manchester where I used to live, the specific bit of Leamington Spa. Um, there's like three or four areas in the country where people will be like, oh yeah, I know what that is. but random person on the streets of London, no chance. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a major concern. Also, where do you even buy discs or bags? Like, do you have local online. shops or do you have to ship? Yeah, yeah, it's all online. We've got UK retailers. Um, shout out to Ace Disc Golf, uh, my retail sponsor, but um, mm. they're fantastic. And uh, we've, so we've got plenty of online stores. Um, and then there's physical shops at some courses. So Quarry Park, Blue Bell Woods, places like that have a on-site shop. But um, the idea of having discs in a disc shop in a random city is a pipe dream here. And when I was over in Estonia and saw discs on the shelves of a supermarket, my mind was blown. <laughs> I also saw that in uh, Ohio, I think it was. I was, I was shocked too, because it still feels like a totally foreign concept to most people where I'm from. I guess what is like maybe a misconception that you think people have about the UK disc golf that since you've been in it for a while, you're like, no, that's not really the case. And you would really understand that once you come. Hope that makes sense. Um, I think people would be surprised at how good some of our players are. Yeah. I think we've got a lot of decent players. Um, there's, a, there's a lad called Joe O'Brien who um, was 1010 rated for a bit a few years ago. He's um, 19 or 20. Um, wow. Noah Smithson, who you mentioned before, he's 20. There's a kid called Ben Holding who is supremely talented but doesn't practice. Who's could easily be thousand rated this year if he puts any time in at all. Like um, we've got a really good, we've got some really good players. Um, we've got, of course, Rachel Turton from Scotland, um, who's been showing up on the on the tour a bit, and she's got a tour card for next year, so you may see more of her next year. Um, and there's another girl called Bella Tate who's great. Um, she went to Worlds and played at Worlds last year. So um, yeah, there's there's more good players here than you think. Um, but obviously, we're very new to the sport in general. 
um, new to the competitive side of the sport. So uh, there's lots to learn on that front. Yeah. I think something else people would be surprised by is the amount of players at some of the courses. Yeah, we don't have very many courses, but um, for example, Longford Park in Manchester, it's a free course in a city park that was put in by the community. And you go there on a weekend and you're queued to play. So what, what do you think drives people to become pros in the UK, seeing as how it's like, it's not really something you just come by. Like you become, or you like have to be in the know to like even play disc golf, it seems. Yeah, I think it's the same thing we're seeing worldwide in disc golf, which is that people just love it. Yep. It's not a sport like football that you, and a lot of people love football, but a lot of people love football because it's what they played when they were in school or it's what their mates watch on a weekend. But it's a sport that you just pick up and then you're just hypnotized by. And it almost feels like you can't do anything about the fact that you love it. Um, it's not a particularly trendy sport to get into. I don't, I don't, um, not a, a buzz at parties for being a disc golfer, but, um, <laughs> but it's, it's certainly a sport that is so easy to fall in love with once you start playing it and you just want to be better. And it's so rewarding when you figure something out and you see yourself progressing. Um, and I think even though it's not a sport that's going to get you paid, it's not a sport that's likely to, uh, see you getting brand endorsement deals and ending up on TV if that's what you're after, but it is a sport that's in, it's very rewarding. And also, I think in the future, um, the fact that it's really cheap to get into will be a huge driver of, uh, of um, people getting into the sport. Here in the UK, we have a massive golf culture. Hmm. There's a lot of golf courses, like a lot, uh, almost, it, almost to this point where there's a golf course in every town, at oh, least. Wow. So there's so much, um, golf courses available but they're for they're for the few you have to the, the price of golf just drives people out of it and with the cost of living crises that are going on at the moment with everything costing more there's going to be less and less people interested hmm. in picking up a new sport that they know up front is going to cost them a lot of money um so once this golf can find its feet and start becoming known people might think hang on i'll try that instead because it challenges a lot of the same things you get from golf um even if at the moment it's missing kind of the culture aspects do you have any like numbers to show historical growth about player counts and all that? It's looking good. Um, we're, we're definitely <laughs> yeah. on the up. We've got, um, from personal experience, there's probably at least four or five times more people playing now than there were when I first started. And wow. that's on a competitive level, but um, on a casual level, I would think it's exponentially higher than that. Um, yeah. I'll dig out some, uh, some stats for you, but I know that we had 500 people play on the tour last year which is pretty good yeah that's awesome just one side note you mentioned that like nobody would particularly think it's like cool to play disc golf i talked to this one kid in emporia that went to like high school in emporia he said it was cool <laughs> so there's yeah like... i believe you well emporia is one of those kind of <laughs> the one instance such a mecca for disc golf yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um I think if you if you interviewed some people in Finland, you would probably find the same thing. Oh, yeah. 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 Is there anything else you want to share? It's important for context to know that there has been a disc golf tour in the UK for a very long time. And the stuff that I'm doing is not new. There's a lot of people who've come before me who've put the groundwork in and um, laid all of the kind of baselines for everything that happens. Um, there's been tour there's been touring disc golf in the UK for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, what I'm trying to do this year is professionalize it and bring a bit more media attention, bring a bit more um, kind of paying a graphic designer to do some cool graphics for us, kind of um, trying to get a bit more, hey, look, there's this thing we're doing. It's really cool. We're going to share a bit more about it rather than it just being this thing that 40 weirdos who throw frisbees <laughs> travel around the country and do. Yeah. Yeah. I think as someone that's like relatively new to the sport, started like 2019, I only know about what I can like see on video. And so that's primarily Jomez. That's like the Disc Golf Pro Tour channel. And there's there's really not too much that I've been able to see about even really much of Europe. Like I know that it exists. I know there's a lot of history behind it, but as me from the US, like I just haven't seen it. I haven't even been to the UK. So it's hard to really grasp the historical nature of it. So yeah, thank you for adding that context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we definitely want to work on that. Um... Yeah, it, was, it was great talking to you. I uh, appreciate yeah, your time. And when I saw your DM, I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for putting up together that video. It got shared in a group over here and uh, a lot of people liked it. So, Yeah. 
I'm glad I could make even the smallest of impacts. I, I love yeah, it. it's great. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for your time. See you later.